I'm glad to introduce uh, this new webinar on the road to Rome uh, 2023. The, the webinar uh, is by Philip Hughes, and uh, he will speak about uh, quaternary glaciation in the Mediterranean area. I thank Philip uh, to his willingness to, to lead uh, the webinar. And uh, Philip Hughes is professor of physical geography at the University of Manchester, United Kingdom. He obtained his first degree in geography at the University of Exeter, and uh, he was followed by, followed by a master's degree in quaternary science, and then a PhD in geography, both at the University of Cambridge, Darwin College. His PhD was on the glacial history of the Pindons Mountain in Greece. This was then followed by a doctorate project examining the glacial history of Montenegro at the University of Manchester. He has since worked on glaciation across the Mediterranean mountains and the British Isles. In this research, he has uh, utilized uh, uranium series dating and cosmogenic nuclides to date glacial landforms. He has also published on global glaciation and stratigraphy in quaternary science and in 2011, Philip also co-edited with uh, Jürgen Ellers and Philip Gilbert the highly successful Xavier volume Quaternary Glaciation Extent and Chronology, A Closer Look. I, just uh, a couple of uh, recommendations for the audience. Uh, I ask everybody to switch off the camera and the microphone. And uh, if somebody has questions, please book them in, in the chat. The, um, the webinar and also the, the question will be recorded uh, and uh, let available in the in the web. And so thanks, Philip. Uh, I'll let you okay. to okay. to present. Thank you. Okay. Everybody hear me okay? Let me know if there's any technical issues and I don't come across clearly. So as uh, Giovanni said, I'm Phil Hughes and I'm from the University of Manchester. Um, and what I'm going to do today is spend about 40 minutes or so um, on a tour of the Mediterranean mountains. Um, this is where I've made most of my research career, starting off from my PhD at Cambridge in the, in the Pindus Mountains. Um, and then I went to Manchester, as Giovanni said, to work in the Balkans further north in Montenegro. Um, and then more recently, I've been in Iberia um, and Morocco in the last few years. So what I'm going to do today, I'm just going to give a little taste uh, of some of the sites I've worked on and some of the key ideas. Many of much of this is already published. So for some of you in the room, it'll be old news. But what I'll hope to do is try and tie it all together. Uh, and effectively, I will end more with questions than I will with answers. So let's first of all start with the um, modern glaciers in the Mediterranean. It gives us a context for understanding the Pleistocene past. Now of course there aren't many glaciers in the Mediterranean today and where they are present they're very small, um, especially in southern Europe. Some of the larger glaciers exist in eastern Turkey and the Pyrenees, but this gives the pattern and distribution of modern glaciers and ice patches. Now some of these may have melted since I last did this talk. I'm not aware of the current state of some of the, the glaciers indicated here. In Morocco there's only snow patches, perennial snow patches. In the Sierra Nevada the, the Coral Valletta disappeared just after the 1920s. So in Iberia it's only in the Pyrenees number four where we have any real glaciers. In the Alp Maritimes, I don't know what the state of your own Pennine Glacier is, you'll know more than me. I don't know about the Calderoni Glacier anymore, whether it's still surviving or not. The same with the Triglav Glacier number seven. But in eight and nine in the Balkans, we now know there's many more small niche glaciers than we previously thought. In Albania, for example, there's tens of small niche glaciers um, and there's a, a surviving glacier at Debeli Namet in, in Montenegro. OK, so there are permanent ice patches and permanent snow features and occasionally 
real glaciers even today. And that's largely due to the seasonal distribution of precipitation and very heavy winter snowfall in some of the mountains that we see here, particularly in the Balkans, where we have over 5,000 millimetres precipitation at the coast. So it's not completely unusual to think about glaciers in the Mediterranean, even in the modern context. These are some of the examples. Some of these are from where some of the audience are from. Some are from Turkey. The bottom one is the Silo Mountains. The one in the top middle is the one I've worked on in the um, Dermatol Massif Montenegro. And then top right is Morocco. I think top left is the Dakar Mountains from Turkey. Now, what I'm going to do today is we're going to place the Pleistocene glacial history in context um, and we're going to look at, well, the timing in particular of when these glaciers existed at larger extents and what does it mean for climate. Now, a particular focus of my research um, has been not a focus, by chance, the results have led us to glacial cycles other than the last one. So when I started out my research, we had an open mind and we thought we were dating things from the last glacial cycle. But as you'll see in the next few slides, in some parts of the Mediterranean, um, we have some older glacial deposits, whereas in others, um, that's in Greece, for example, whereas in other parts of the Mediterranean, like Morocco, I only find late Pleistocene, last glacial cycle. So we find this in other people's work as well, um, from the authors who work in Turkey through to Iberia, different records, whether they're real or whether they're an artifact of the dating techniques, we're still grasping and we're developing as the science progresses. But as I say, there's lots of people now working on the Mediterranean glacial problem and I expect in the next decade we'll have some great advances and we're already getting there from different teams working on different regions. So the last glacial maximum, depending on how you define it, some people 21,000, but I go for 25,000. That's the classic. And of course, in some parts of the Mediterranean, they represent the biggest glaciers in the mountains that are recorded. Whereas in others, Marine Ice Top Stage 2 and the last glacial maximum is a small player in the Pleistocene glacial history. Um, and what we're going to do today, we'll go to some parts where the LGM is a small event relative to the bigger glaciations and we'll go to some places where it's a, a significant event. It's always there, it's always a, a significant glacier advance, it's just that in some places the Middle Pleistocene glaciers were much bigger, whereas in others um, the Late Pleistocene, the last glaciers, were at a maximum slightly earlier, sometimes 30,000, 50,000 even earlier in the last glacial cycle, okay, but not always. There's never a simple story for the Mediterranean glacial history and what we're starting to find is complexity um, and what I aim to do with my research in the next few years is try and understand well why do we see differences between different regions and what are the drivers of that and how real are these differences are they real in terms of the dating techniques providing the right answer or are they artifacts of the dating techniques so a little bit of background of course Lots of work was done before I started doing any work, um, and it had been done for the last 150 years. We knew about glacier um, advances in the Pleistocene in the Mediterranean mountains from Penkham, um, did work of Penkham Bruckner fame in the, in the Dinarides, in the Dinaric Alps in the late 19th century. There were lots of authors from different nationalities observed more extensive glaciers uh, of the various massifs across the Mediterranean. And then that got developed. People were aware of the glacier limits and the glacier extent. And this is a map from Bruno Mesley, um, who passed away a couple of years ago, did a fantastic work in the 1960s and early 70s, reviewing the state of knowledge of the glacial history of, of the Mediterranean. Um, what we knew is we had a very good grasp of the limits. We knew where the glaciers were, we knew how extensive they were, but what we didn't have a good grasp of was the timing. And it was often assumed that they, well, they must simply date from the last glacial. Um, and Bruno was well aware there was some Mauritian stage, so the penultimate glacial cycle in some places, but most of the well-preserved moraines were attributed to all the same time, the last glacial maximum. 
we review that and Bruno wrote a review a prelude to this book which was contributed to by various authors from around the Mediterranean region which was 2017. This is an updated map from that book and it pretty much looks the same as Bruno's map in 1967. A few tweaks, slight differences, but what we must be stressing with this map is these are the snow lines, equilibrium line altitudes of the maximum extent of glaciers in the Mediterranean mountains. Now, following on from what I've told you, some glaciers reach their maximum limits in the middle Pleistocene, some reach their maximum limits early in the last glacial cycle, some reach their limits at the LGM. So this map is therefore diachronous um, and not all these snow lines represent the same time. And the big challenge now is to produce a more dynamic map producing the snow lines ELAs across the Mediterranean at different times, constrained by the various dating techniques. I don't believe we're in a position to do that yet, but we're getting there. Um, in some parts of the Mediterranean, it's very well dated, for example, Turkey, have a very good constraint on the LGM. Whereas in other places, we don't have a full pattern yet. So we're not able to produce ELA maps for the LGM, for the early glacial cycle and for the middle Pleistocene, but we will do in the next few years, I think. Now, this is the pattern cartoon, if you like, of the glacier distribution at maximum extent in the Pleistocene. So we had glaciers um, in the Atlas Mountains. That's becoming more um, apparent. We always knew for 100 years we've had, or even longer, glaciers in the Atlas. Um, but the actual precise extent and timing is, is starting to become known. In Iberia, of course, the Pyrenees, the big um, ice extent over the Alps, and then down the Apennines and on the islands, okay, of Sicily, um, Corsica. Not sure about Sardinia, whether they were real glacial deposits or periglacial, you perhaps can tell me. And then we've got the Balkans, and the Balkans to the south quite well constrained, but in Greece now there's work from my colleague Aris Leontaritis, Cosmos Pavlopados, who've done some work, are extending on what I've done, and they're finding glacier extent in Greece was much bigger than, than was previously thought. In the Balkans further north, I'll touch on it later, I'm not going to go and talk much about Croatia and Bosnia, but there's also some issues there about, well, how extensive was the most extensive um, we know a lot about the late Pleistocene, it's well dated now, um, and again, in Bosnia, the uh, Turkish team of the Slovenians have dated there. We're going to go on a tour, and we're not going to do everywhere. I'm going to focus in on what I know most about and the places I've worked on, um, and I'll leave the other areas for others. Um, we're going to focus in on Greece first, I'll give the glacial history of Greece, and that started off my research and probably gave me the baggage, if you like, uh, and the perspective of how I view Pleistocene glaciers in the Mediterranean, um, for good or bad. Um, then further north, when I started at Manchester in Montenegro, Albania. Then we'll go to Spain briefly, talk about some work done in Sanabria by a student of mine, Tom Cowton. And then we'll finish off with the most recent work I've been doing um, in the Atlas Mountains. Um, and that's ongoing. And as you can see, there's lots of areas I'm not going to cover today um, because I've only got 40 odd minutes. Now, the Balkans, very mountainous. I started off working in the northwest um, parts of Greece. This was in uh, 2000 to 2001. Um, and I'm going to go through the evidence here. Originally, in my research, I was supposed to be working further north in Kosovo on the North Albanian Alps, but at the time in 2000, as always seems to happen in Europe at some point, we, it wasn't a good time to be working in that part of the world. But later, by the time I finished my PhD, things had settled down and I then went further north and worked in the former Yugoslavia, in Montenegro and Albania to the south. The interesting thing about the Balkans is that Greece is very interesting, and I've got a soft spot for Greece, fantastic glacial geomorphology, but of course the most extensive glaciers in the Pleistocene were in um, Montenegro and also further north in Bosnia, Croatia. But in Montenegro, where I know a lot about, we'll have a look at how extensive the ice limits were. Okay. Let's start with Greece. This is a snow line map 
equilibrium line altitude map for the glaciers of Greece. This is for the maximum glaciers of Greece. And there's a strong west-east um, gradient in cert floor altitudes and also moraine limits and also the reconstructed glacier equilibrium line altitude. So the lowest glaciers occur in northwest Greece um, near Mount Timphy, which is number four on that map. And then you get a strong rise in the altitude of the glaciers as you go east. OK. Now, one interesting thing that we found in 2004, which wasn't expected, is the age of the oldest moraines. We've used various techniques, um, including uranium series dating of cemented tills, which gave infinite ages at that time from moraines at altitudes of around 800 metres. So these were dated to beyond the limit of uranium series, greater than 350,000. And that was the line I went with in the Greek work and also later in the Montenegrin work, which used that single technique. For those of you who doubt that, we'll go on to the chlorine 36 dates in the next um, the later part of the Greek slides, and we'll see, well, where are the last glacial maximum moraines and, and how does that fit with the late Pleistocene? But it was important at this time because we weren't perhaps expecting such old moraines that had been found by my colleague Jamie Woodward and Mark Macklin in earlier work and also in the fluvial record. Um, and my job was to go and find, well, is it real? Is it widely found? Um, and so on. And it was widely found. Um, and we found evidence of, a late, of an early um, Middle Pleistocene, well, not early Pleistocene, it was Middle Pleistocene. We correlated it with marine ice up stage 12, so equivalent to the Elsterian in Northern Europe and the Anglian. But we didn't really have precise ages. We simply had a bracketing age of these cements from multiple sites, often clean cements, so there was no issue with contamination and so on, which suggested they're old. We also had soil evidence suggesting deep weathering of the moraines. I'll show you a picture from Montenegro. Um, again, suggesting they're old. But there's also Mousterian artefacts on some of these moraines, which isn't Middle Pleistocene, but it's early, earlier than the LGM. And the archaeologists find early um, dated um, artefacts on moraines, which we had previously correlate with the Middle Pleistocene, which was reassuring. This is the geomorphology. The mountains were covered by ice caps. Some of my earlier glacier limits might need revising now. Now I'm older and wiser. They're still extensive, but there may have been more ice caps. I tended to map ice fields. But as I say, newer students, PhD student Aris Lenteritis from Harokopio University has suggested glaciers were even bigger than I first suggested, and I agree. So this is the sort of situation on Mount Timphy, and this is the map. And this shows the different extents during the different glacial cycles, which is quite unique, um, not just to the, it's not unique to the Balkans, we find the same in Montenegro, but it's not found everywhere. For example, in certain parts of the Mediterranean, we only find the last glacial cycle, and we find sometimes just remnants, patches, MIS-6 moraines, for example. Anyway, this is the pattern that was mapped by me in 15 or so years ago, um, where we have an extensive Scamnellian stage glaciation, which we correlated from really nice up stage 12. Some people have suggested, well, is it older than that? It may well be, it could be, um, but I've got no evidence to suggest a stage 16 or 14, so we're going with 12 at the moment. We've got a penultimate stage, marine ice top stage six. You'll note that other glacial cycles correlating with eight and 10 seem to be missing in the sequence. It doesn't mean there weren't glaciers, it's just that they were smaller than in MIS six. And then you're asking, well, where are the last glacial cycle moraines in Greece? Well, at the time, we didn't have good dates on these limits. We simply said, well, these are the highest parts of the valleys in the Cirques must belong to the last glacial cycle. And we had quite limited geochronological control about that, but we did have good chronological control on the Middle Pleistocene. And there came the work of my student, James Allard, who's recently completed his PhD, to test the hypothesis that we had that the moraines in the highest cirques and valleys 
must date to the last glacial cycle, to the last glacial maximum. As I say, we didn't know that for sure before. It was simply on morphal stratigraphy and the fact that the oldest moraines were thought to be middle Pleistocene. Um, and James found through use of chlorine 36 on limestones that indeed the highest moraines did give ages which corresponded with what we tend to think of as close to the last glacial maximum. Slightly earlier um, in MIS2, between 29,000 and 25,000, but pretty much where you might expect um, the largest glaciers of the last glacial cycle to date from. But that's important because, for example, you can see my cursor. What it proved was that what we'd lumped in here as the Timphian, as the last glacial cycle, is now confirmed to be the last glacial cycle. And what's interesting is that what cosmogenic ages do you get off the lowermost moraines? We get a reversing of the dating sequence. We get good geochronological control here, 29,000, and then an inset moraine of 25,000. But when we get to the lower old deposits, we get ages which make no sense. For example, we get some Holocene ages in these, and that represents exhumation of the moraines and destabilized, uh, eroded lags of sediment. Okay? But the most important outcome of this work was to have a clear constraint on the last glacial maximum and the deglaciation of Greece. And this is what we think from James's work was the extent of glaciers at um, MIS2. Okay, and you can see we've got two phases. We have um, glacier extent at around 24.5,000 Ka, um, and then ice was more extensive about 5,000 years before that at 29,000 years or 30,000 years before that. But all these blue glaciers date from MIS2. That's the most important thing to know, and we're very confident of that now. What's also interesting from Mount Timphy is that we don't have uh, lake glacial moraines um, in some of the highest cirques. Some places we do, but in some of the highest cirques you can see the high clear cirque moraines date to 24.5 ka. That's not to say the other ice isn't in Greece, it is present, but it's present on mountains in other areas, such as Mount Kelmos, which is further south. You may think, well, that's a contradiction uh, to have human dry glaciers further south but not further north. But it tells us about the precipitation patterns through the Balkans during the late glacial and late Pleistocene, where we think it might have been wetter further south, reflected in the tracks of depressions through the Mediterranean. This is Mount Kelmos, which was glaciated by an ice cap during the most extensive glaciation. Ice went down to around two uh, around thousand meters. Um, 1,500, sorry, you know, 1,200, I think, in the northeast here, nearly a 1,000, okay, and that's the nature of the ice here. It's not quite as extensive as in elsewhere in Greece, but we do find a three-phase situation. Now, again, we have moraines dated to the middle Pleistocene from the lowermost deposits, not just with uranium series, but with optically stimulated luminescence dating of glacial fluvial outwash, and like we've done in in Timphy, well, we did the Kalmos chlorine 36 first. Um, we've dated the highest glaciers, so phase three in this um, shading, to the last glacial cycle. And I'll show you some of the evidence here. So, this is the oldest glacial deposits. We had glaciers as a plateau ice field or ice cap over the mountain. We've got huge alluvial fans. And these are closely tied in with the glacial geomorphology and they're cemented. And we've utilized that for uranium series. Um, we're not dating the moraines in this photo, we're dating the outwash, but we also date the moraines higher up too. And again, these come out old in the middle Pleistocene. Um, but we also have OSL, independent evidence from the outwash. And again, these come out in the middle Pleistocene, giving ages of marine ice stage six and also um, stage 12. We don't have a clear glacier morphostratigraphy separating the glacier phases like in northern Greece. So for example, the penultimate glacial cycle, stage six, we're not clear on where the moraines are. Um, all we can say is that we've got old glacial deposits in the Peloponnese, 
um, like we have in northern Greece, but we don't have a great control on the sequence. And these are the uh, deposits and extent of outwash below these ice fields on the mountains. What about the last glacial cycle? Well, in this part of the world, we have ages which are not too dissimilar to Timphia, Northwest Greece, give ages between 30 and 39, they're a bit older. Remember from Northwest Greece, they come out 25 to 30,000 years, whereas here, they're about 10,000 years older. We've got several of these ages from moraines. Um, and what it seems is we've got retreat moraines, which seem to date to the classic LGM. So in this part of the world, we interpret that as glaciers were present in the last glacial maximum, but as climate was certainly cold, probably the coldest of the last glacial cycle, it was also very dry. And we think that glaciers retreated because of aridity. And also in Northwest Greece, rock glaciers formed. Now, what about the late glacial? Well, we do have quite a lot of evidence now from Kelmos, which is different to what we find in Northwest Greece, um, where we have a lot of late glacial ages from moraines classically correlating with the younger drives in clear moraines in the highest cirques um, at altitudes reasonably low it's about 2100 meters here whereas in northwest greece we don't find equivalent age moraines and this is interpreted as well in northwest greece on smolicus we do have younger drives moraines but they're at 2400 so the difference in altitude, the lower lake glacial moraines, Eumadrias moraines in southern Greece must reflect increased winter precipitation in this part of the world. OK, and that's really quite interesting because it tells us about the tracks of winter depressions through the Mediterranean. And we speculate that they would have tracked further south through the Peloponnese. We're going to go further north now to Montenegro. Um, and Albania um, and look at the evidence there. As I mentioned already, the glaciers were much more extensive than in Greece in this part of the world. It's the wettest place in Europe, or one of the wettest places in Europe. This is Kotor on the coast of Montenegro, has an average at Krikvich in the mountains in the background of over 5,000 millimetres. And the record precipitation in 1937 is 8,043 millimetres, so huge winter well huge annual precipitation majority of which falls in the winter as, as snow now that's important because to keep in mind because the glacier extent on orion this is from mount orion on the coast near herceg novi near the border with croatia and there in the background is the sea this is the outer part of the Boca Kotorska, um, and there's the Adriatic Sea. And you get clear glacial features, um, U-shaped valleys, moraines, and so on, not down to the sea, but down to about 400, 500 metres at their lowest. Um, and the mountains here are not particularly high for Mediterranean standards, reach about 1,800, 1,900 on the coast. And we think from the geomorphological evidence that there must have been significant ice caps over this part of the world. There's the moraines and the glacial geomorphological evidence is pretty clear. It's been recognised for hundreds of years or more. Jovan Sivic mapped it, Penck mapped it in the late 19th century and it was followed up by Soichi in 1911. So there's no disputing the geomorphology. Uh, all we've done is reinforce it. Um, and provide some ages for the lowest deposits. And again, like in Greece, we get old ages off the most extensive glaciers on Orion. Um, you can see the succession here. We've also utilized alluvial fans and we've applied dating techniques there. And these support the fact that we had big middle Pleistocene glaciers over Mount. Orion, and that gives the extent, that's the sort of size we're talking about on the mountains of Orion. Now I'm going to go further inland now to Dermatol. So this is in central Montenegro near Zablak. Um, and we find glaciers, or a glacier, that exists today. The Debeli um, um is well known, and it's a clear glacier. It's not very big, but it's about five hectares. 
Um, it's dynamic, it's moving, and it's not just a snow patch. And there's been recent observations from the mountains of northern Albania, uh, from me, Milovan Milovacevic, and Emil Gatchev, and there's many more of these existing glacierettes, niche glaciers, or glaciers, whatever you want to call them, in the mountains of the Balkans. So it's not difficult to imagine a significant expansion of ice during the Pleistocene. But what we're seeing from the Balkans uh, is that the ice was pretty extensive. So even with the depressions of temperatures we know from the Pleistocene, um, you must have had sustained precipitation even in the Pleistocene cold stages. And we're not saying it was as wet as today, but we're saying you're still talking about substantial precipitation. It's hard to be as wet as today, if it's 5,000 millimetres, but even if you have a few thousand millimetres with a depression of temperature of five to eight, five to eight or 10 degrees Celsius, you would produce extensive ice masses in Montenegro. Now, what about the Pleistocene in central Montenegro? Well, it's clear from the evidence, from the work I've done, but also from the work that was done 100 years before I went to Montenegro by many of the the previous researchers that there was extensive glaciation. All we've done is provide a little bit more precision with the limits and provided dating. And again, we think it was middle Pleistocene. We get infinite ages off the oldest deposits. And we also think there was a penultimate MIS-6 extensive glaciation in Montenegro. <laughs> and also, of course, the last glacial People say, well, where were the last glaciers, the last glacial cycle glaciers, the LGA? Well, they were pretty big. Uh, they were 10 kilometers long. They just weren't as big as the middle Pleistocene ice caps. So when I say the middle, ice, middle Pleistocene glaciers were the biggest, people, I'm not saying the late Pleistocene glaciers weren't significant. They were. They just look smaller on the map than the middle Pleistocene ones. Supporting evidence for the old middle Pleistocene glaciers is also from the soil evidence is very deep weathering some of the old moraines um, and that is indicative of weathering through multiple glacial interglacial cycles. We also got the uranium series dating and what I've not shown you here is the most recent work from Montenegro. We have dates now from Dermator um, and we have classic uh, LGM through to deglacial ages in the mountains of Dermatol, which like in Greece, is consistent with the, the limits that we've mapped as late Pleistocene in the earlier work. So the chlorine 36 helps um, with the geochronology now. Of course, with such old moraines, you'll never really be able to get any grasp of the exposure history um, because of the dissolution of the limestone. It's, it's, it's hard enough dating late glacial and LGM moraines uh, on limestone terrains um, and it's been shown even in the Balkans you can get ages which are too young um, so it's now an impossible to apply cosmogenic dating to the old deposits so we have to be imaginative use uranium series use optically stimulated luminescence on outwash and so on this is the extent of ice uh, landforms, the geomorphology in central Montenegro, we get extensive glaciation. Some of this is late Pleistocene and then it's superimposed onto a glacial landscape which is very old. Okay, It does raise questions about the degree of limestone weathering, on, especially on the old um, terrains. Uh, how can we reconcile limestone weathering rates with the glacial landscapes that we see? And that's a problem we're going to have to grapple with. Um, and how we interpret cast landscapes in the glacial context. Anyway, I think the key thing to understand is there were extensive glaciations of the mountains of Montenegro. And the center of the middle Pleistocene Montenegro ice cap doesn't have classic ice molded features. A lot of it's very um, weathered because it's very old, of course. Um, but when you step back and look at the landscape as a whole and match up where the moraines are, then we must have had a big ice cap over large swathes of the Montenegrin landscape. And we think, as with Greece, this has occurred during marine ice top stage 12. And there's other independent evidence which is suggesting this is the most likely, likely candidate. 
There's also work further north. You can see there's some Croatians in the room from work I've done with Lurka Marginac in, in the Vela bit. Lurka had ideas about even very extensive ice over large parts of Croatia. I've seen some of the evidence, and I think there is some evidence of very extensive glaciers and low-level glaciers in parts of Montenegro, but it's not always clear. It's difficult to interpret. It's not very well preserved in places. And there's been recent work showing that the late Pleistocene moraines do, in fact, date from the late Pleistocene. There's people from Slovenia and um, um, Turkey have recently dated those, showing that they do date from the late Pleistocene in the higher parts of the Vela bit. I'm not going to go there for this. We're going to go to Iberia next. Um, and we're going to talk about some work I've done in Northwest Iberia with a student of mine, Tom Cowton. Now, this is a, a snow line map, an ELA map from um, Iberia. And it, effectively, the snow line, wherever you go in the Mediterranean, again, this is uh, diachronous. It dates from different times depending on when the glaciers are at their maximum. But all these snow lines right across the Med look exactly like the precipitation pattern maps that we see in the Mediterranean today. So effectively, what it tells us is that the maximum glacier extents were driven by the patterns of precipitation uh, and the drivers of the patterns of precipitation, so the position of the polar front and the jet stream, in exactly the same way where we see patterns of precipitation driven today. So in northwest Iberia, we had snow lines which were remarkably low for this latitude of around 900 metres, whereas in the far south, in the Sierra Nevada, snow lines were as high as 2,500 millimetres. The work was done in the Parc National Lago de Sanabria. Um, there's been other workers which have followed on since, and I'll highlight their work in a minute and mention their names. Um, and Tom's Cowton's work was to establish the extent, um, not so much the timing, we did a little bit of dating, but not much on the, um, the timing of the last ice caps of this part of the world. Now, the geomorphology is remarkable uh, for this part of Spain. It doesn't look like Spain. Um, it looks more like where I'm from in Wales. Um, but we have classic U-shaped valleys evidence that ice overrode the mountain tops um, and completely submerged the landscape. So it has a geomorphology more akin to what I'm used to in, in the British Isles. The question was, well, what age is this? Is this from the last glacial cycle? And we try to avoid going there with our Greek eyes on, because of course in Greece and Montenegro, we found middle Pleistocene glaciers very extensive. But we went with an open mind, not knowing what to expect in Spain. The moraines are very clear, very well preserved, very um, pronounced. Um, and these have been dated in recent times by Laura Rodriguez Rodriguez after we did our work. Um, and she found that these all date to the last glacial cycle. And that's evidenced from calls the lakes, which was done in previous work. In our work, we use the lake radiocarbon carbon evidence um, to argue that these moraines and boulders formed during the last glacial cycle, possibly at the last glacial maximum. And we had an ice cap here, which dated to the late Pleistocene. And as I say, the lake said it was evidence the radiocarbon carbon dating over the several decades of work by other researchers seemed to point that this must be late Pleistocene and not older. And Laura's work with her co-authors confirmed that with cosmogenic dating, boulders like this, and also optically stimulated luminescence. So the contrast from Spain is that the clear evidence that we have here is dates from the middle of the late Pleistocene, the last glacial cycle, whereas in Greece and the Balkans, we have a, a more complex sequence of glacial succession. There is Middle Pleistocene glacier evidence in Iberia, um, but it's not much bigger. The glaciers were not much more extensive than the late Pleistocene glaciers. Um, and these have been dated in the Cantabrian Mountains. They're known from the Pyrenees, date to marine ice up stage six, with some hints of older Middle Pleistocene glacial extents. But the glaciers of the Middle Pleistocene weren't much bigger than the late Pleistocene. And in many places, the last glacial cycle 
was sometimes bigger. And that's important because it tells us about differing patterns of precipitation uh, delivery to the Mediterranean basin from west in Iberia to east in the Balkans at different times during the Pleistocene coal stages. Do I know exactly what was going on? Not yet, but the next few years, hopefully, we'll try and get a more sophisticated analysis of, well, what was happening at different times in different glacial cycles to try and understand all of this. And that'll be helped by further dating. Now, to finish off, we're going to go to the Moroccan mountains, to the Atlas Mountains. This is the last study area, and this is the work I've been doing in recent years. And again, we went there with an open mind, not trying to force any particular glacial succession theory onto the atlas and just see what the results show. Um, we worked on Tubkal, which is the highest mountain in North Africa, 4,167. I've been working there since the 90s, but only seriously since 2007. But as with everywhere else in the Mediterranean, there's a, a long, long history of glacial research in the High Atlas. It started off in 1878, George Mao went with Joseph Hooker on a tour of the Great Atlas and noticed the moraines. Thompson in 1889 and 1899 wrote about the glacial geomorphological evidence, and that was followed up through um, the early 20th century, in particular by Manuel de Marton, who seemed to get around everywhere in the Mediterranean, um, wrote about all kinds of different parts, um, and, and made, made some really important observations. And it's my view that the early research was right, almost everywhere in the Mediterranean. The early work, 100 years ago, they got it right in terms of the geomorphology observations and so on, was spot on. Sometimes not, but usually, okay? The big challenge then was dating and placing them in time. And we really went in a bit of a doldrums, if you like, in the Mediterranean, across the Mediterranean mountains, where we didn't really advance knowledge much up until the last two decades. And that was simply because we, we didn't have the dating approaches in order to put these early observations, which we mostly correct, in context. And this is just a, a quote from Joseph Thompson's work of an undoubted evidence of a glacial period in the history of the mountains in the shape of moraine heaps, warm rocks and boulders in their glens and valleys. And it's as if he was talking about the mountains of the Alps of Scotland. But no, he was talking about Morocco as early as this, this um, communication. Now, Tubkal is volcanic. It's old Cambrian rocks, pre-Cambrian rocks, andesites, rhyolites, some granites, and we used a combined beryllium and chlorine approach. And the idea was to get an idea on the succession timing of the last glaciers of this region, or with any glacier. This is the extent of glaciation in the High Atlas. Some of the glaciers reached um, up to 10 kilometers long. There were ice fields. Some um, completely some submerged some of the plateaus, such as the Tazahat. Um, so they weren't small, um, and they're quite extensive throughout the High Atlas. The challenge then was to date these features. So we took um, the task of mapping the moraines, working out the morphostratigraphical succession, and then applying exposure ages to see what the sequence of glaciation was. And we had over 50 uh, exposure ages from this concentrated area of the High Atlas. And this was done in collaboration with um, the Scottish University's Environmental Research Centre in Glasgow, but also with the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. Um, and David Fink at the latter has been working closely with me on the Moroccan sequence. And we've also got a project looking at the modern snow patches of this area. But just to summarise, what's the story? Well, the most extensive glaciers in Morocco date to 30 to 50,000 years. That's what the exposure ages tell us, dating to early or pre-LGM, but not really old. They're, middle, they're not middle Pleistocene. They're early in the last glacial cycle. Um, the problem is, of course, we've got erosion of the moraines, uplift in seismic activity, there's dynamic landscape as to whether these are, are 
real ages or they're simply ages you get off old boulder lags which are older but i think based on the statistics we think these are real so the idea is that we've got a glacier maximum in the last glacial cycle around 30 to 50,000 in marine ice stage three we get evidence of truncated spurs cutting the valleys and so on and it's the geomorphology is is quite clear in many parts where's the lgm it's very well presented but it's in the mid valley positions stratigraphical unit number two in our sequence and these give consistent ages of 20 to 25,000. and as we get younger the cosmogenic ages get better what i mean by better is they get closely packed around uh, for example 20 to 25,000 years here for the old moraines it's a bit of a mess it's not always easy to interpret then we get to the last glaciers well, not the last but the the last of the late pleistocene and these give ages which are consistent with the younger drives and these are very very tight the ages are all around 12 12,500 and we're very confident about the presence of a younger drafts moraines here now just to finish off um the important thing about morocco like as with everywhere else in the mediterranean is this presence of snow surviving the year today and this is called the neve permanent which was mapped in 1937 by della della hay um and this is still there uh, and there's moraines in front of this neve permanent which we're hypothesizing might even be Little Ice Age, the uh, Holocene in age. And we've got a project at the moment working out, well, what was the difference between the small Holocene glaciers in the high atlas compared to the Pleistocene? And that's a talk for another day. Um, but this is what it looks like. It's only there because of local topoclimatic controls, avalanching um, and shading. Um, and it's well below the theoretical snow line so in theory it shouldn't be there but we do find it survives the, the hot summers of morocco now whilst local topper climate is important um in order to produce the magnitude of glaciers we see in morocco even once we get beyond the niches into the big valleys um the climate modeling the glacial climate modeling suggests that even with large depressions of temperature we still need quite a lot of precipitation especially to produce big ice caps and valley glaciers um, so we think that it must have been wetter um, than today in the, the late Pleistocene when we had these glaciers there and that's really important because it's important to, for understanding the evolution of the Sahara um, next door um, and the concept of um, effectively goes back to the early literature of the, the, the concept of pluvials and so on and this has been followed up in recent work by others this is Lucia who's got evidence from speleothems and they've suggested a southerly track of depressions at the LGM in the Western Mediterranean. And that's consistent with um, the glacier climate modeling we have in the Atlas Mountains, that depressions from the Atlantic must have delivered moisture at a further south, a track further south than we see today. And there's similar themes further east with the Peloponnese. Now, the problem with everything at the moment, people like to come up with a grand theory, but I think we're not quite there yet with the glacier evidence to make a convincing argument as to exactly what was happening across the Med. So that's the challenge over the next few years. And I know there's various groups working in different places. This is my penultimate slide. Um, and the challenge is with all the different teams working in Iberia, in Turkey, in the Balkans, in Italy, in Morocco is to establish the timing of the glaciations um, and are there significant differences across regions. Then we want to understand and interpret paleoclimatic um, signal in the glacier record but that's only useful if we know how it relates to time. Um, so we need to make sure the geochronology is in place and that's getting there for large parts of the, of the Mediterranean but there's still significant areas which aren't dated at the moment and then once we know the timing once we know the paleoclimatic significance of the glacial record then that has of course big implications for all the other quaternary scientists people interested in um, plants and animals and the evolution of flora and fauna through glacial cycles okay and i hinted before glaciers uh, particularly closely tied to climate um, and therefore we can make 
big inferences about geomorphological zones from the Atlas record in North Africa. The supply of moisture to these glaciers has big implications for our understanding about the state of the Sahara, for example, at different times in the Pleistocene. Now, on its own, the glacier record isn't going to be able to do this. It's, I think the, the future understanding will have to be tied in with the continuous records from lake sediments um, and perhaps even the marine record, um, because the glacier record is by nature fragmentary um, and it's only as well recorded as the, the last most extensive glaciation and you get diminishing returns on, on the evidence. So we need to take into account the fragmented nature of the glacial record and we need to work with other quaternary scientists, particularly those who work on long sequences through glacial cycles, to anchor our glacier records to those. Now, my final slide, I must say this isn't all my ideas and my work. I've worked with many people across the Mediterranean. Some are listed here, some are not listed, so I'm sorry if I've missed people out here. Um, uh, and it's very much a team effort. And of course, there's many other researchers working in other parts of the Mediterranean, and we're collectively getting there. Okay, thank you very much. And hopefully that provided you an insight into the nature of the glaciations of the Mediterranean mountains. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip, for this very comprehensive uh, and uh, very interesting uh, seminar that you 